So hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining PC Vendor's webinar today on what's new in 2023 R1. We have an exciting call for you all today to go over what is in the latest version of the ERP you all use. 2023 R1 is the latest major release from Acumatica and has some substantial enhancements that will make your lives easier when using the platform. I'm Strati Moustikais. I'm the content marketing specialist at PC Bennett Solutions, and we also have our technical sales engineer, Nathan Newberg, on the line today. And during this webinar, we're going to dive into how Acumatica is enabling you to better control your verticals with specific examples in manufacturing and commerce. We'll then jump into how they are creating a more intelligent platform with a focus on inventory and order management. And then we're going to close out the call today with some final notes on specific use usability enhancements like info tips and some system administration items as well. Now that I'm finished with my small little preamble, I'm going to pass the mic over to Nathan, who's going to give us a much more robust and involved overview of, uh, I'm sorry, overview and demonstration of 2023 R1. So Nathan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Scotty. Hi, everyone. I'm Nathan. I'm the technical sales engineer here at PC Bennett Solutions, and today I get to share some of my favorite new features and enhancements in Acumatica's latest 2023 R1 release. <clears throat> we'll start with talking about uh, some of the additions in the manufacturing. Uh, we've got deallocation capability now. Uh, we can look at history of MRP and uh, some great new side panels available to us. With 2023 R1, Acumatica has introduced the ability to deallocate unused materials from production orders. In previous versions, when a user manually set the status of a production order to completed, if any material on the production bill of material had not been fully issued to the production order, the item plans for the material allocation would still exist on the inventory allocation details form. The only way to remove the material allocation was to close the production order. And sometimes this didn't make sense at that time. Open item plans for materials from completed production orders would still impact MRP because it continues to consider these materials as demand. Now we've introduced the ability to manually deallocate materials for production orders that have the completed status. <clears throat> By setting this to complete, there's no longer demand for this production order and item plans are removed. Additionally, production managers can now also manually allocate materials for production orders that have the completed status. Let me show you. If we take a look at the production order details screen in Acumatica, we now have exposed the status of the materials in the material panel. The status indicates whether the materials have been issued for operation, whether the materials have been allocated for the production order, or item plans for those materials exist. A material status of planned, released, or in process will all have materials showing as allocated to the production order. Material in completed, closed, or canceled status will not have materials allocated to the order. On the production order maintenance form and the production order details form, when the production order is, is in completed status, users will be able to set the material status to completed in the ellipsis menu. We can take a look at how that works by entering a new production order. I'm gonna enter a regular order for our base units. We're gonna make 10 of those today. I'll go ahead and save it. And we'll release the order. Oops. There we go, now it's released. The order is in planned status. You can see that we have 10 to create. There we go. All right. Um, Something changed in my plan. Now I only need to make seven or maybe I'm part the way through. I've made seven. I don't wanna finish all 10. We're only gonna complete the seven. So I'm gonna enter a move transaction here uh, to complete the last operation for seven units on my production order. When I save that transaction, I can remove the hold and release it. This is going to update my production order inventory demand. Give that a second, there we go, and close out of there. When I refresh my production order, we should see that we now have 
seven items completed with a quantity of three remaining. Now, if I open the new production order details side panel, and we'll talk more about these coming up, I can see on the production order materials section uh, for operation 10, I'm requiring one unit of black dye for each, and we have seven actually on the order now. If I hit the allocation details button in the materials panel, I'll be able to see all the item plans for that material. And you'll note here at the bottom, I've got uh, order number 53 demanding three of those available items in, from my inventory. I'm not going to complete those three. So what I want to do now is complete the order. I'm going to go ahead and do that. When I hit, click complete order, you'll notice that the status of the order changes to completed uh, on both the details and maintenance forms, yet the materials are still in process. What that does is enable the set material status to completed and open uh, buttons in my ellipsis menu. I've favorited the completing button. When I hit that button now, you'll notice that the material status changes to completed. If I run the allocation details inquiry one more time, I should see that the inventory for order number 53, the plan has been removed. Now that inventory is available to use in other orders. So uh, in summary, with the ability now to manually allocate and deallocate materials to production orders and build of materials, uh, users can um, complete open item plans and open item plans are now accurately reflected, resulting in better demand planning when MRP is run. With 2023R1, we've also introduced the ability to compare the history and details of previous MRP runs in order to benchmark past performances. In previous versions, a planning manager could only view the audit history for the most recent run of material requirement planning by using the Regenerate MRP form. Planners didn't have a way to benchmark past performances of MRP, and they couldn't tell if MRP times varied due to a larger amount of data being processed or if there were other data or setup issues. Now with 2023R1, we've introduced two new inquiry forms, the MRP history and MRP audit history forms. So the planners can analyze the performance of re MRP regeneration. The MRP regeneration, uh, sorry, the MRP history form allows planners to view historical MRP regeneration process runs to see how long each run took and compare the numbers of records that MRP had to plan. The MRP audit history form allows users to view the details for all of those past MRP runs. We've also added a new history action on the Regenerate MRP form to make it easy to get there that launches the MRP history form. Let's take a look. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my Regenerate MRP form. Close out my other tabs. You'll note here at the top, we now have the history button. If I click the button, that takes me to the MRP history report, which has now uh, newly been generated. I can see all of my past MRP runs. I can see the duration uh, that it took to run that. I can see the number of records that were run and any variance there. If I click uh, the date on one of these results, I can see the details of uh, that run. And this is what we, I, I would normally see on the regenerate MRP slide. So uh, to recap, with the addition of the new MRP history and MRP audit history forms, planners can easily compare historical data for previous MRP runs to better analyze MRP performance. We've also added a whole lot of new side panels for our manufacturing modules. Uh, here you'll see the names of those inquiries and dashboards that we've added uh, as side panels for you on the, on the slide. Uh, but I think the best way to talk about this is to just show and tell. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the uh, production order maintenance screen where we can talk about the new side panels that have been added there. We have six new side panels today. And if you don't believe me, just wait. Uh, we'll start with the production order details side panel where you can view the production order and its bill of materials simultaneously. Remember here in the side panels, you can also make edits uh, if need be, all while maintaining your view of the order maintenance screen. 
On the critical materials side panel, we can now run the critical materials report and have it in view as well uh, to determine if you're short any materials for your production order, obviously a uh, pretty critical screen. The MRP results by item shows the MRP details related to the inventory item you're producing. The production order analysis dashboard is actually a new dashboard added in Acumatica, gives us KPIs by operation. Operation 10 is red because it's over completed, but operation 20 is blue because it's in progress. We've only completed a portion of the planned quantity. If I scroll down, I can see metrics related to labor hours and cost variance. The production order supply documents side panel allows us to quickly see all of the supply documents related to the production order. Uh, it'll show links to any assemblies or other purchase orders on this order. Now, if I move over to a, another example here, a different production order in uh, our system, we can see that we now also have a sixth panel for project tasks. Now, this one only appears if you have tasks linked to uh, the production order maintenance order that you're viewing. Moving over to the production order details screen in Acumatica, another favorite view of ours. Uh, similarly to the maintenance screen, we've added a link back to the maintenance so we can get from details back to the production order maintenance screen, the vice versa of what we had on the other screen as well as that production order supply documents. So while we're viewing the details, we can see if there's anything inbound on that one. We also have the vendor shipments side panel, which is gonna show vendor shipments related to this production order, the operation that the shipment is linked to, the material quantity that was sent to the vendor and the vendor it was shipped to. Where used in production orders side panel is a new generic inquiry that displays all of the production orders that use the material specified in the form. If I take my MG sheet 10, for example, populate that into my where used in production orders, this is gonna show me every production order in the system that has uh, a handle on that material in case I need to move some things around. So now we're gonna jump over to the bill of materials screen where we've added three new side panels. Here we can see bomb attributes, should there be any related attributes to this bill of material, uh, as well as engineering change requests, should there be any, as well as engineering change orders issued for this bill of material. On the estimate operation screen, We've added the estimate side panel. So while you're looking at this operation here, you can see the details of the estimate uh, it's related to. We also have this side panel available on the estimate operations primary list, uh, in addition to the estimate operation panel. So here's your estimate details. And now you can view the operation as well, all without leaving the list of operations. Moving uh, over to the MRP display screen now, related to MRP again, we have some new side panels as well. If we're looking at the MRP display, we can open the side panel to view the detail of the, the detailed inquiry related to this MRP. On the MRP exception screen, we now have the MRP detail as well. And Nathan, so I think adding these side panels is really important when it comes to like making data more accessible in the platform. But is this data stuff information that was already previously in Acumatica or is there new fields as well? Great question, Strati. Thank you for asking. Uh, I'm going to jump back to the slide so that you can see. Um, in addition to all these great side panels Acumatica put in for us, they've also added a few generic inquiries and dashboards. These inquiries are informative and can be run standalone or used in other dashboards. So all of the links you see on the screen are available. And pro tip, although you can't find them listed in any menu in Acumatica, they're actually visible in the hidden node. You can still use the screen ID and paste that into the URL so you can uh, access these inquiries um, through the user interface. We'll talk a little bit now about the commerce side of things. Uh, we've got some new return functionality available in our Shopify and uh, added enhanced functionality for Shopify POS when it comes to running multiple locations. And we also have meta field support now in our big commerce connector. 
In 23R1, we've enhanced the refund and returns capabilities coming from Shopify. Most merchants that we talk to that use Shopify say they prefer to manage the returns and refunds inside the Shopify system. From their perspective, they don't want their teams losing a lot of time in processing refunds and returns. They want to make it as easy as possible. And with the Shopify admin, it really is easy. As you can imagine, returns and refunds can become very complicated as well. And there's a lot of different scenarios that a return can be in. For instance, the order could be in one of many different states. It could be open. It could be in the process of being shipped. It could be shipped already, uh, or it could be at the recipient's address waiting for them. In addition to that, there's a lot of different types of returns. Sometimes the customer wants to return a product and get their money back. Sometimes the customer wants the item, uh, but they the item they received was damaged. So they have to return that one to get a new one. Uh, other times the customer is just frustrated about something that happened during the shipping or delivery process. Or maybe the shipment showed up a few days late and they want some of their money back, but they wanna keep the product. Shopify will allow return requests for all these different types and it's important that Acumatica accepts that information from Shopify and makes the process of closing out the return and refund as seamless and as automated as possible. One of the challenges that retailers came to us with were instances where a customer had bought an order of several different items and they requested a return or refund while the items were being shipped. Now, sometimes part of the order had been shipped and they received it while the rest of the order was still on back order, making it a partial shipment. Sometimes the entire order is on back order. These different scenarios where products are in limbo used to be difficult for managing returns and refunds due to the information that gets passed back and forth in the Shopify API. But Shopify's API has been improved in the last couple of months and we're taking advantage of some of those improvements, keeping Acumatica modern and making processing returns and refunds even easier when the order is in a state of shipping or partially shipped. Now, to do this, in order to do this in, inside of Acumatica, you'll have to enable the refund entity inside your Shopify store. If I open up my Shopify stores screen here and move over to the entities tab, you'll see that refund is available here at the bottom. We're gonna to have to activate that in order to get our refunds syncing back and forth. Once that's enabled, you're gonna to need to um, set up a return order type in Acumatica to be associated with this Shopify store. That's configured on the order settings tab. You'll note here that we have a return order type box in which we can select an order type available in Acumatica. Whichever order type you've selected for this return type, you're gonna to need to make sure that that order type has the validate card refunds against original transactions unchecked. Uh, for obvious reasons, sometimes the refund's not gonna match the original amount. Uh, then your system will be ready for this flow. If we take a look over at the order types tab for the e-commerce RMA order, you'll note down here that we have a validate card refunds against original transactions checkbox. We'll check that off, uh, uncheck it in other words, in order to uh, process these properly. With these new settings and features, uh, you'll be able to manage Shopify returns process within Shopify with much better support from the Acumatica ERP in the background. In the POS system, Acumatica now has improved support for multiple locations in Shopify. If you have Shopify POS and you're working with multiple locations, you can enable this functionality. Whenever a customer comes into a retail location, most of the time they're gonna buy a product and take it home with them that day. That's what we call a direct order. There are also instances where a customer comes into a retail store and for whatever reason, they wanna buy a product, but it's not available to take home that day. The retailer is instead going to ship it to them at a later date. Shopify POS allows you to take these orders, collect the information about the customer, enter it in with the order, and then submit the order that will flow into Acumatica as a standard sales order. So your fulfillment team will fulfill that order just like they do any other order that's going to be, and that's going to be your POS shipping order type. By mapping uh, the Shopify location with the warehouse inside of Acumatica, you'll be able to send inventory levels from Acumatica out to the Shopify POS system. And as customers come into the store, if there's a product that they can't find, the retailer will be able to use Shopify POS on their tablet or smart device to look up the item and then see the inventory amounts across all the different locations. It's a great way to capture the sale, even though you don't have the item in stock where they are. The retailer can choose either to ship the item to the customer, or they can even have uh, take the order from the customer and have them pick it up at another location. 
So we can take a look at how this setup works. Uh, if we take a look back at the Shopify stores, move over to our order settings tab again. Here I have uh, an import POS checkbox uh, that we'll check off to make sure that our POS orders come in. And we'll be able to associate order types with both the direct order type and the shipping order type. So we'll be able to support all of those various scenarios. Now in the warehouse mapping section, this is where you're able to uh, map your Shopify locations with respective warehouses in Acumatica. And by doing this, uh, we'll be able to see all the inventory in all of those stores within Shopify POS now available. With this improved functionality in Shopify POS and Acumatica, retailers can now fulfill orders in a larger variety of ways and from multiple locations. Big commerce customers can now create, well, they always could create custom fields, but now we can import them into Acumatica as well as made of fields. We can create extra fields to hold additional information such as details about products, sales orders, and customers. And starting in Acumatica 23 R1, users can set up the system to import those values stored in made of fields of big commerce orders into Acumatica ERP. Let's take a look. If we open up the entities form, this one related to our uh, big commerce store as set up in our Acumatica instance. Let's close out some other tabs again. We're gonna look at the sales order type entity in this case and add in a new import mapping. Let's choose the sales order ERP object. We're gonna use the note field in this case. And when we open up the external objects, Drop down. Now we can see that order data and meta fields, order meta fields from orders are now supported for import. Uh, one note that if you're setting up a, um, a mapping for sales order, you're going to want to name the external field value in the namespace dot key format, like so. Big commerce customers can create custom fields in their stores to hold additional information such as extra details about products, sales orders, and customers. And now those custom fields will be imported into Acumatica. Um, moving there from there into our uh, order management side of things, um, one of those uh, abilities relates to commerce as well, or can as well. And we'll talk about uh, mixed order behavior for improving counter sales and uh, the improved handling of commercial invoices now available in 23R1. When orders are imported into Acumatica from an external system that already calculates the sales tax, such as an e-commerce site, tax rates may change over time. This could result in incorrect taxes in Acumatica ERP, and it can and often did create a discrepancy between the two systems even if just a penny, which is just enough to give you a headache, as I'm sure you can imagine. This obviously needs to be avoided. Uh, in these cases, taxes should not be recalculated in Acumatica. Also, the system should not recalculate taxes on modifications of sales orders uh, to avoid any discrepancies between those two systems in that case. In Acumatica 23R1, we've added the ability to turn off automatic tax calculation in order to preserve imported or manually entered taxes. The new Disable Automatic Tax Calculation checkbox has been added to the Order Types configuration screen, which sets the automation behavior and sets default behavior for that same checkbox on the sales orders and invoices form. If we open up the Order Types screen for our previous example, we're looking at our SC uh, commerce sales order type. Uh, we can see down here, we have disable automatic tax calculation available now. So when we import those taxes, Acumatica doesn't redo the job and cause uh, a problem for us. Uh, if we look over at the sales orders screen after we've enabled that uh, checkbox on the order type, we'll see on the financial tab of the sales orders screen, uh, that that setting should flow through as well. Uh, we also have control here at the order level if we need to override tax calculation for an individual order. Like sales orders, also uh, on the invoices screen, that, uh, that checkbox is available as well. Also on the financial tab, uh, if we look here, this time it appears in the tax info section 
you'll see that disable automatic tax calculation checkbox there as well. So now that we can disable automatic tax calculation at the order level, we can be sure that the ERP will respect the taxes calculated by the external system and avoid any unnecessary discrepancies and reconciliation going forward. With relation to counter sales, in previous versions of Acumatica, when sales clerks enter lines and sales orders with an order type that includes both issue and receipt operations, they had to manually change the operation type when needed. In 23R1, this data entry has been streamlined with fewer clicks. Users can now skip the step of changing the operation type. Uh, so now while entering the quantity of a line, we can simply change the sign of the quantity. This automatically updates the line operation type to reflect the negative value. It'll also show other quantities and values for that line as negative, such as quantity on shipments and the extended price. Purchase orders, transfer orders, and direct vendor returns are supported with this feature. The printed form's also been updated to show negative signs where needed, and all the user, uh, all these user interface updates will streamline data entry and reduce the number of clicks, also improving accuracy. This is fantastic for wholesale distributors who want to add another sales channel by having a counter somewhere in or near the warehouse where customers can walk up and make purchases or, and return items. If the order total is positive, uh, the system will allow the creation of payments and if the resulting document uh, and the resulting document will be an invoice type. If the order total is negative, the resulting document may be a credit memo or possibly a cash return, depending on the order types AR document type and will allow counter sales rep uh, to create refunds. So let's take a look at how the new counter sales solution works in uh, 23R1. First, we'll examine uh, one of our order types to make sure that we have the template settings con correctly configured. If I look over here at the template tab, I'll see that I have operations both for issue and receipt uh, involving invoices and credit memos as the extension. We'll go ahead and enter a, a new sales order. Close out some of our other tabs. And I can demonstrate how uh, this functionality works, how greatly it is uh, improving the user experience for sales order entry. First thing I wanna do obviously is, is change my order type to the MO mixed order type that offers us this feature. I'm going to choose a customer from my list. There's a, a customer right at the top. And I'll start entering some details for our order. Customer is going to be purchasing a computer today. We're going to add one of those, a positive number, to the order. You'll notice that the issue for this line item operation, as the operation for this line item is issue. When I add a second line, We'll choose a different item in this case, possibly uh, a Lego set, because when the customer assembled it, they realized it wasn't going to work for their uh, computing needs. They're going to return that item and uh, purchase a, a proper computer. You'll note that when we issue a uh, negative sign on the quantity field, the operation now becomes receipt for this line item automatically. I didn't need to change that. It also extends to our extended price and affects our order total uh, by reducing the order total by that amount. If I save this order, I'll now be able to take a look at the payments tab where on further processing, I may be able to create a payment against this positive order value. Now, maybe the situation were different. And if I look back at the details screen, uh, the, the customer was bringing in quite a few of those Lego sets. They were hoping to outfit the whole office and uh, they didn't work. So now we're ending up with a, a negative order total um, overall. If I move back to the payment screen now, I'll see that the create payment button is grayed out and this allows me to create a refund for this negative value. So with that, now counter sales reps have an easy process to sell and return items on the same order with a balance that is either positive or negative and are able to accept payments or process refunds all while staying in the sales order entry screen. Now, when we're talking about international shipments, uh, those must have a commercial invoice document attached to the shipment package. 
anybody shipping internationally knows how um, this is an issue and, and can be improved in terms of automation. So in addition to the regular carrier label, uh, shipping clerks need to be able to print these attachments from shipments for single or multiple shipments and warehouses need the ability to automatically print a commercial invoice at the time the shipment is confirmed on the pick, pack and ship screen. The new commercial invoices report form has been added to the printed forms category of the sales orders workspace in Acumatica. And by using this report, a shipping clerk can print commercial invoices generated for international shipments using the ship engine integration. When we select the new print commercial invoices automatically checkbox on the warehouse management tab of the sales order preferences screen, uh, and also in the user settings of the pick, pack, and ship screen, the commercial invoice for a shipment is printed automatically at the time the shipment is confirmed in pick, pack, and ship. Great uh, addition and efficiency. Let me show you. So if we take a look at the sales orders preferences screen, I'm going to move over to my warehouse management tab where we'll see down here we have a checkbox now to automatically print commercial invoices when they exist. Moving over to the pick, pack, and ship screen, if I have uh, Device Hub enabled, you'll note that under the uh, user settings button, now we also have that print commercial invoices automatically checkbox checked, which flows through from our sales order preferences. Of course, we can do this individually at the shipment level using the new action button available in the ellipsis menu for printing commercial invoices. I've starred that one so it appears as a button on the top of my screen now. So uh, when we select the new print commercial invoices automatically checkbox on the warehouse management tab of the sales order preferences screen, and also in the user settings of the pick, pack, and ship screen, the commercial invoice for a shipment is printed automatically at the time the shipment is confirmed in pick, pack, and ship. Talking about some of the overall usability enhancements in Acumatica, we've got improved support for info tips and a couple of other uh, system administration type things that are gonna greatly improve our uh, performance and reliability in Acumatica. In Acumatica ERP 2023 R1, info tips have an improved presentation. Also, info tip coverage has been greatly increased throughout the system. For example, on the enable disable features form, uh, this one was asked for a lot, especially by bars like ourselves. We can see here quickly uh, what each feature does. A user can view info tips for boxes, check boxes, and option buttons that appear on the tabs and in areas of most common Acumatica ERP forms, as well as for table columns on many of those forms. Users access the info tips for table columns slightly differently than they access those for other elements, but in both cases, the info tip for an element is accessed by clicking a small question mark icon, as you see on the screen. When a user hovers over the label of a box or a checkbox or an option button for 0.5 seconds, the system will display the question mark next to that element, and you can click it. Check it out. Heading back to our sales orders screen again, that's a common one. Uh, I'm gonna hover over our project uh, label here. And you'll see if I do that for just a half a second, I get the little question mark circle pop up. I can click that now and see details about the field right here on the help form that opens. We also have a link there to the standard sales orders form reference to get the complete help documentation on the sales orders form. To view the info tip on a column header or a column field, uh, we can simply click the column and you'll note that the info tip icon now appears in the lower left of the dialog box that results for filtering. When I click that icon, now I can see we have information about the field header that I've clicked. Uh, if you wanna get the complete help reference, context relevant help reference like you had before by clicking the question mark icon, you can do that uh, as usual, or also by clicking the expand icon uh, next to your individual detail there. Tool tips are a great way to get at the help documentation in Acumatica, which is uh, extensive and thorough uh, and very helpful even to myself. Uh, and I, I use it all the time. 
In Acumatica 2023 R1, we've added tools to help administrators and users better manage their business events. Now you can trigger a business event using an action. This improves the efficiency because the system doesn't have to monitor fields for record changes. The business event executes after all other activities related to the action are completed. I can demonstrate this by creating a new opportunity. And um, what I want to happen is when I open the opportunity, I want to assign a task uh, to the owner to make sure that it gets followed up on. So I'm going to select a, a business account here. I'm going to go ahead and save it. Oh, we need a subject. So we're going to ask someone to assign this, please. And actually, I'm going to ask the system to do it for me because uh, I want to take some of the effort out when it comes to doing this. I just want it to happen automatically. So when I click the open button, it's going to ask me for some details. When I move to the next stage, as the opportunity gets opened, that action that I just clicked should invoke the business event that I've set up, and we should see a new task has been assigned to the owner here. Now, how does that look in setup, right? Uh, if we look over at the uh, tools menu here, we can access the business events dialog at the record level. This gives me the opportunity to create a new business event related to the form that I'm on. If I click create business event, it'll ask for a name. If I open up the one that we've set up for this demonstration, I can show you how it works. Looking up here at the business events screen in the type field, we see we have a new type uh, triggered by action. Again, greatly increasing the efficiency of the system and reducing that load. I can select, um, I can still set trigger conditions down here in the details, but those conditions are not monitored continuously. They only invoke when the action is selected. On the subscribers tab, I can create a new subscriber uh, based on a task or any of the others that you see listed. We can have multiple subscribers and do uh, more than one thing each time this event is triggered. Uh, but let's take a look at this task subscriber that I had set up uh, for this example. If I click the link on the subscriber, that takes me to the new task template uh, where I've indicated some instructions in the body. I can use system variables as usual in templates, also in the subject. Uh, I can set some settings at the task for uh, date variables or contact information and so forth. Now, uh, when I activate this uh, task template and the business event associated with it, I will uh, be able to invoke that action each time that open action is uh, committed. If I look in the business events dialog again, uh, I also get a handy link to history for uh, this business event related to the record I'm looking at. So I can see if there were any errors or uh, results of that execution. Great uh, efficiency for getting around the system and enabling users to automate actions without increasing the load on the system. So uh, to recap, we've got uh, new business event actions uh, to trigger those business events in the system. Uh, that's going to increase our reliability and um, overall performance. Another usability feature that we've introduced is um, the ability to set uh, user timeouts. Uh, as we've seen throughout, Acumatica is always striving to improve the user experience and, of course, safety and security are always most important. For security, the system automatically logs users out after an extended period of inactivity, and that default was set to one hour. But now Acumatica administrators can update the user inactivity timeout on the security preferences screen. Previously, if you wanted to change this value in a SaaS deployment, you would have to open a support case, or if you were running in a private cloud, you could directly modify the web config file, but you would need some administrator experience or access to do that. This, of course, comes with the hassle of restarting the website and possibly causing users to lose their work if they weren't pre prepared ahead of time for that short delay. So if we take a look at the security preferences screen, you can see how this works now in Acumatica. 
Uh, my existing timeout is set to use the web.config file as usual and defaults to the standard one hour. If I uncheck that box, you'll see now uh, that the dropdown becomes available and I have more options, both shorter and longer. Maybe I wanna give my users a little bit extra time before they time out. If I revert to using the web.config file, I can easily turn that off and it returns my uh, timeout to the default of one hour. Obviously, uh, if the timeout's too short, it can be a, a source of frustration um, if it's too short for your working style. And a common request is to make this uh, modification to lengthen it. Uh, now we're giving empowering users with the ability to do that without support as just another way uh, Acumatica is listening to customers and continuing to provide value in the product. So uh, that was some of my favorite new things in 23R1. Uh, and it's really just a scratch in the surface. Uh, I hope I sparked your interest about some of the features in the new release and the benefits that come with those. If you'd like to know more about what's in, this, in store, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, please reach out to us. And uh, with that, I'm gonna thank you. And Strati, back to you. Yeah, so just again, thank you all very much for attending today's call. And now that we're done with uh, Nathan's demonstration, I'd just like to remind everyone in the audience that we do have the Q&A feature enabled. So if you have any questions about what he went over during the presentation, we have a good couple minutes. It looks like around 15 minutes until the hour's over. So if you have questions, feel free to throw them our way. But um, just a reminder of what we covered today, we addressed innovations in the manufacturing and commerce modules, like the deallocation of unused materials for production orders and new support of big commerce meta fields in order import. There were some unique features added to the inventory and order management functions that help make Acumatico a more intelligent platform, like the ability to disable automatic uh, calculation of calculations of tax. And then there were some additional great usability enhancements like the addition of info tips. And, you know, like Nathan said, so many of the improvements that are added to 2023 R1 are based off both the user and developer feedback. So as you're using Acumatica, make sure you're trying to integrate yourself with user groups, community discussion boards, and some of the other resources that Acumatica provides. And you know what? Maybe when we do our What's New in 2023 R2 webinar later this year, we'll have some of your innovations in there. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to thank Nathan. He did an outstanding job. He poured through Acumatica developer notes to get this demonstration done to kind of really tailor it to our clients and make sure that you are all receiving uh, information that's relevant to how you use the system itself. So definitely appreciate the work he does there. And we'll just take a couple more moments, see if there's any questions that roll in, and then we'll close out for the day. Uh, so we just got one, Nathan. Does the timeout actually time out the user? Uh, they use the web.config timeout, but still find users logged in even when uh, they know they're off. This was an issue in early releases. Um, great question. Um, and I see that question came in from uh, Patrick. If uh, Patrick, you reach out to us, we can investigate some of the details about how you're doing things now and how this might change in the latest release. Uh, and if there are any issues that you see uh, with how it's working, we can help you troubleshoot those and investigate further as, as to what's happening. Okay, yeah, so it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So we'll close out today's call with a reminder that if you have any questions that you didn't ask on the presentation, but would still like answered, don't hesitate to reach out to our customer success manager, Ben Kress, whose email is on the slide you're looking at right now. And thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much for attending. Thanks, everyone.